last session of the day. Um, please join me in welcoming Thomas Petrozzoni, who's going to talk about a tour of the ARM architecture and its Linux support. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Thomas, and I will indeed um, share some thoughts about the ARM architecture and try to give an overview of kind of how it works and how its Linux support is, is, is organized. So a few words about me. I work at Free Elections. It's a uh, embedded Linux consulting company. We're uh, located in France. This is why I'm speaking that weirdly. Uh, we do uh, embedded Linux stuff. Um, a lot of bootloader and Linux kernel development, and a little bit of uh, build system work as well. Most of our work is focused on ARM uh, platforms, so we help uh, ARM vendors uh, bring support for their processors in the mainline kernel, and we help uh, embedded system makers uh, bring Linux to their uh, platforms, which mainly are, are uh, ARM-based. So we do contribute quite significantly to the uh, Linux kernel in terms of support for ARM platforms and uh, a number of our engineers are uh, maintainers of various ARM uh, sub-architectures or uh, driver subsystems. Uh, on a more personal side, uh, I've been working on uh, the support for Marvel processors in the kernel since about uh, four or five years now. And, oh, battery is running, is ready, okay. And I also work on a project called Bitroot, which is a build system for uh, embedded Linux um, platforms. And I happen to uh, come from Toulouse in the southwest of France, so quite a far trip from here. It's my second time at LCA, and I'm really glad to be here again to uh, share another talk with you. So ARM is everywhere. I guess um, everyone uh, in the Linux community has heard or even possibly uh, used um, ARM platforms. It's in your phone, it's in your TV, in your router, in your set-top box, in your car, in your... Uh, a IoT device in your uh, favorite OBS development platform. It's pretty much everywhere. And through this talk, um, I, well, what it gave me the idea of this talk is that a lot of people come from an x86 background and don't necessarily um, understand what are the differences with ARM in terms of um, how it's, the, the architecture is organized, what it means in terms of Linux support, in terms of software support around it. There are a number of differences. And if you try to think x86 when doing ARM work, you might misunderstand a number of things. So um, I will try to clarify these as much as I can, of course. Uh, so I'll talk first about the um, hardware aspects. Um, what is ARM from the, uh, the architecture's perspective all the way to a given hardware platform? And then talk a little bit about the software level. Um, so ARM is a company in the UK. Um, it's been recently purchased by another uh, bigger company, but it uh, still originates from, from the UK. And this company um, first writes uh, architecture specifications. So basically, these are documents that specify how a CPU works. It defines an instruction set, including possibly some multimedia DSP instructions. It describes how a memory management unit works. It describes how interrupt and exceptions are handled, how caches are working, how virtualization can be accelerated, and that kind of things. But it's really just a specification. Uh, so it's a document that they call the ARM ARM, which is the ARM Architecture Reference Manual. And it's, as you can imagine, a fairly voluminous documentation, but that's only documentation. So over time, uh, they've made this uh, architecture evolve. So we've got ARMv4, ARMv5, ARMv6, ARMv7, ARMv8, uh, which is the, the, latest, uh, the latest one. But again, it's really just a specification on how a CPU um, can work. Based on that, based on this specification, ARM uh, develops IP cores. So IP cores is for the, um, the, the people uh, doing hardware development, the kind of uh, the similar thing to a software library in the software world. It's kind of a fuzzy metaphor, but it's probably the, the easiest thing you can uh, think of an IP core if you are of a, so of a software developer. So it's a, a piece of hardware logic that um, describes um, how hardware signals are converted into other hardware signals to produce an interesting um, outcome, and you can use that to create uh, uh, complex um, hardware logic such as uh, processor cores. So based on their specifications, ARM create IP cores uh, that implement those specifications. Um, so for example, ARM 926 is a given implementation of ARM v5, or Cortex-A15 is a given implementation of ARM v7a, or Cortex-A53 is a given implementation of ARM v8a. 
So we already have two levels of thinking. We have the ARM architecture, which is a specification, and then we have the ARM core, which is an implementation of a given specification. We can have multiple possible implementations for the same architecture specification. So it means that you, have, uh, you can have two ARM cores that actually behave externally the same way, but internally are uh, implemented differently. For example, we have uh, Cortex-A5, 7, 8, 9, 12, 15 that mostly uh, behave the same way. They actually have, some of them have a few extensions, uh, have some other improvements, but in essence, they are implementing the same instruction set, the same MEMU, the same uh, exception handling, and so on. It's just that internally they are different, and they are different in um, mainly performance versus power uh, trade-offs. So um, Cortex-A15 is, for example, a very um, poor um, um, performance-oriented implementation, so it has a very deep pipeline, lots of out-of-order execution logic, lots of complicated logic to improve the performance, but that requires more transistors, so you get a, a bigger uh, CPU which consumes more power. And the other side of the spectrum, something like Cortex-A5, is much more limited um, in, in, its, in its performance, but also consumes less power. But they implement the same specification, so they can run the same code. This is not hardware, right? This is only the design of a hardware. So ARM does not sell processors. They only sell IP cores that other entities can purchase to ultimately produce actual hardware that you can buy and you can see in your uh, embedded device. So the next kind of layer is uh, ARM system on chip. So if you've got a CPU core, that's great. It can execute instructions that produce a result uh, from uh, input data, but taken alone, it doesn't do much. You most likely need memory, uh, you need peripherals um, to make a uh, useful system out of it. So in the ARM world, we have this concept of uh, SOC, system on chip, where the idea is you integrate into a single chip essentially all of the components that you need to make a computer system. So not only the CPU, as I said, but also peripherals, memory controller, internet controller, USB controller, other bus controllers, display controllers, audio, and sometimes um, some very specialized um, um, peripherals for uh, accelerating you know, crypto operation or other aspects. And you integrate all that into a single chip so that people who make systems out of it don't have too many other components to integrate. They put that chip on their um, system and almost everything is there. So um, the ARM ecosystem is made um, of many companies that we call SOC vendors that purchase cores from ARM. So they purchase a license from ARM and the code of those ARM cores, they integrate it. They integrate around um, this um, CPU core a number of other IP cores for the different peripherals and they produce actual processors out of that. So there's a very, very large spectrum of SO ARM SOCs available to address numerous markets. You will not use the same SOC for a high-end phone or for a very low-power IoT sensor. It will be a completely different SOC with completely different peripherals. So there's a wide variety of SOCs and SOC vendors in the ARM ecosystem. So to take an example, here is the block diagram of the Freescale IMX6 um, SOC, which is a pretty popular one in, in the automotive market, industrial market. Um, so if you look up here in the middle, we have the Cortex-A9, so that's the actual ARM core. And we can have up to four of them, so it's up to a quad-core SOC. Here at the top, we have the, uh, the memory controller, so we can attach some DRAM to this um, SOC. Here we have some clock and reset handling so that it's clocking all the other hardware blocks in, that, in this SOC. So this big block here is what is your little chip on, the, on your development board or in your phone or in your car. So that all fits into a single physical chip. Uh, you've got lots of IOs, um, PWM, GPIOs, um, CAN bus controllers, Ethernet controllers, things like that. Uh, we get some uh, a GPU in there. We have image processing to output some um, pictures on displays. And we've got lots and lots of other peripherals. So as I said, there's a very large spectrum of SOCs that will make different combination of peripherals. Some will have uh, more UART controllers than others. Some will have uh, display capabilities, some not, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a very, very wide range of um, SOCs. All these hardware blocks, are programmable, 
and they have registers that you have to read and write to to actually make the hardware perform something useful. And so they need uh, Linux um, device drivers in any operating system, but we're mostly interested in Linux in, in this discussion. So that was the kind of the third step. And the last step to bring you an actual uh, useful um, system is what I would call the hardware platform. So even though an SOC is a system on chip, it's actually not um, self-sufficient. Uh, it needs additional things around it. Most of the time you need at least RAM. You need some storage, NAND flash or EMMC or other types of storage. You need some power circuitry to provide power uh, to the SOC so that it can operate properly. In some cases, you might need a display panel and, and touch screen. You may need a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip if it's not built into the SOC. Some of them have built-in Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. Some of them require external chips. You might need files for your um, Ethernet controllers. You might need an HDMI transceiver if it's not a built-in functionality. You might need a CAN transceiver. You need connectors, and so on and so forth. Um, so your SOC is going to be connected to a, a variety of peripherals to a number of buses on a PCB, so on a, on a, um, on a board, um, to make the system um, work. So we've got schematics. So these are the schematics for the um, $9 computer called Chip from, from Nexing in the, um, that was on Kickstarter uh, a, year, uh, a year ago and is, is still shipping. So it's a little board uh, based on an ARM SOC that has a number of uh, peripherals around it, mainly uh, RAM, flash, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, power secretary, and, and, and other connectors. So we really have um, four levels to think about when we talk about ARM platforms. We've got the ARM architecture specification. I am ARM v5, ARM v7, ARM v8. Then we have the ARM core itself. I am using ARM 926, ARM Cortex A8, Cortex A15, etc. Which system on chip I'm using? Um, I'm using a NatMail system on chip, all winner, Freescale, TI, Marvel, and there are plenty, plenty of other um, uh, SOC vendors. And which specific hardware platform I'm using? I'm, I'm using a Raspberry Pi, a chip, um, this given phone or this given TV or this given car that integrates an infotainment system. So let's take a few examples of, of boards. Um, the Raspberry Pi 1, um, so it's a board, so that's the last thing here, and I'm just going back. Um, the SOC that it contains is the Broadcom 2835. It's, this SOC itself contains an ARM core called ARM 1176JZF, which itself implements the ARM v6 architecture specification. And all those information are important to understand um, what is the Linux support for this platform. The Raspberry Pi 2 has a different SOC, the 2836, which differs just by one digit, but uses actually a different ARM core, the Cortex-A7, which itself implements a different ARM architecture, ARM v7a. And that's quite important because it means that uh, code that you can uh, run on the Raspberry Pi 2, compiled code, compiled binary code, will not run on the Raspberry Pi 1. They don't implement the same um, instruction set. So it's somewhat um, uh, compatible in some ways, but it's not entirely compatible. So you can run ARM v6 code on ARM v7, on ARM v7 but not the opposite. The chip, which I just mentioned earlier, is based on an all-winner SOC, which um, implements, um, which uh, contains a Cortex A8 core, which itself implements the ARM v7a architecture. So these two ones implement the same um, ARM architecture, so they can run the same user space code. Um, the Espresso Bean, another uh, platform that, um, that is relatively cheap, based on the Marvel SOC. It's uh, the Marvel Armada 3700. It uses a dual-core Cortex-A53, which itself is an implementation of the ARM V8A um, uh, architecture specification. So as you can see, each time we have the architecture specification, the core, the SOC, and the actual hardware platform. So sometimes I've been hearing, especially um, as part of my uh, work on Billroot, I do support lots of newcomers in the ARM and embedded world, and they ask, like, is there support um, for ARM in Linux, or is there support for ARM in Billroot, or is there support for ARM in this or that? It doesn't make a lot of sense, because you have to be much more specific than that. Which SOC are you talking about? Which um, uh, actual board are you talking about? So we need all this information to know um, 
the level of uh, software support that is available for your given hardware platform. The ARM core, the SOC, and the board are all important information. So asking, is there, Linux, is there support for ARM in Linux doesn't make a lot of sense. It's more, is there support for this specific hardware block of that specific SOC in the Linux kernel? That is a question that makes sense. So all three levels are needed to support a given hardware platform. And the, the next thing is that it's not only does it support it, but does it support that specific functionality that I need? As you can see, again, in that block diagram, a SOC contains a tremendous amount of IP blocks. And it's very unlikely that any given system will support all of those IP blocks and all of the possible features that they have. So Linux may have support for a certain fraction of those IP blocks, but not necessarily all of them. So it might be a, a good fit, depending on your uh, specific target application. And Linux may also not necessarily make use of all the possibilities of all those hardware blocks. Hardware developers are very creative. They add lots of functionalities to hardware, which operating systems sometimes use, sometimes don't use. Um, so ARM v7 itself has a number of variants. Um, there is the ARM v7a, which is the one you're most likely, um, uh, most likely the one to encounter in, in, in your projects. It's the application um, variant of ARM v7, so it's designed to run a full featured operating systems such as Linux that require a memory management unit, caches. Um, it supports um, uh, two instruction set called ARM and, and SUM2. SUM2 provides uh, higher code density. It has a, a VFP, which is vector floating point operation, and in it's kind of optional, but you can have uh, neon instructions, which are um, SIMD instructions to accelerate um, multimedia related uh, operations. So for example, Cortex A8 or Cortex A15 are um, implementations of ARM v7A. There is also ARM v7M, where M stands for microcontroller. Um, and for example, Cortex M3, M4, M7 are implementations of, of ARM v7M. So it's a, it's a smaller variant. It uh, doesn't have a memory management unit. There are no caches in M3 and M4. It was added in M7. Um, it supports only Thumb2. Uh, it, it is indeed lower performance, but also a lower power. So Linux can run on those ARM v7M, um, but requires external RAM and flash. So our ARM v7M is really microcontroller oriented. So we'll find lots of ARM v7M SOCs that have built-in RAM and built-in flash. And the idea is that you don't have to have external RAM, external flash on your system to lower the cost, lower the power consumption. But they have too little uh, RAM and too little flash to run a uh, full-blown Linux uh, kernel currently. So there are a few M3, M4, M7 platforms that have enough external RAM, external flash to run an actual uh, Linux system. Um, so some people use it this way, but I believe most of those um, SOCs are used without external RAM and flash to run either bare metal code or uh, smaller real-time operating system, free RTOs, or other things like that. Um, there's another variant that's less widely known and, and less widely used, uh, at least in the in the visible um, R market, I would say, it's ARM v7R, where it stands for real time, and it's focused on deterministic response. So there are lots of um, uh, features in the CPU core to ensure that um, you can write code in a way that is as deterministic as possible. So things like um, uh, no, 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 not necessarily a pipeline or uh, out of order execution, that kind of thing that makes the um, execution time um, non-deterministic uh, are not used. And it's typically um, used in storage devices, so your uh, typical SSD controller make use of uh, ARM v7R um, based SOCs. Um, so these are totally different variants. The one you may encounter are really uh, A and, and M for a number of projects. Um, more recently, I would say, but it's still a few years back, ARM v8 was introduced. And the main big feature of ARM v8 is obviously the introduction of ARCH64, which is a new 64-bit uh, instruction set. Uh, it's actually optional, so you can have an ARM v8 SOC that doesn't support 64-bit. But that also, um, ARM v8 also introduces a, a number of other improvements, but ARCH64 is the main one. They kept um, another mode called ARCH32, which offers backward compatibility with ARM v7a. 
This allows to run uh, ARM v7 32-bit application on ARM v8 or even a full 32-bit uh, system on, on ARM v8. So there are a number of ARM v8 cores like A32, A53, A57, A72, which, is, uh, which are currently like kind of the high-end uh, ARM cores that you can find. So over the years, um, um, ARM has made the um, uh, specification evolve with uh, gradually more and more features. So that's a diagram from the ARM website itself. So from ARM v5, they've moved to ARM v6, bringing uh, VFP v2, which, is, um, which are ve vector floating point operations. Before ARM v6, you do, did not necessarily add a, a floating point unit in, in hardware. So that was uh, added in ARM v6. And Jazel was an extension to accelerate um, um, Java virtual machines. I'm not sure how far it's, it's actually being used, but that's, it's there. Uh, in ARMv7, they added SUM2, so this uh, alternate instruction set that allows for a higher code density. Instead of having all instructions encoded on 32 bits, you can mix 32 bits instruction and 16 bits instructions in the same code flow, so it increases code density. Trust zone, which is a security related functionality, and SIMD, um, which is for, as I said earlier, accelerating uh, multimedia uh, operations. And then they brought ARMv8. Um, with mainly the 64-bit uh, instruction set and a number of other features. So it's progressively um, evolving over time. Um, there is another concept in, in the ecosystem, the concept of architecture licenses. So most of the SOC vendors uh, buy ARM cores from ARM. So they buy an, an, an already made implementation of an ARM core, and they only, only work on the peripherals around it. It's already a, a huge amount of work. But some SOC vendors decide to take a different route, and instead they, they purchase an architecture license. So they purchase from ARM the right to implement from scratch another CPU that complies with the same specification. So they don't buy the core, they just buy the right to implement another core that complies with the same instruction set, same memory management unit, and so on and so forth. So a few examples are below. Marvel did that in a number of, uh, of products. Uh, Qualcomm does that a lot in their, in their products. Apple is doing that as well. So for example, Apple um, Swift is an implementation of Armory 7A, which is used in the um, Apple uh, A6, which itself is used in some of the iPhones. Nvidia does that as well. Caviar, Broadcom, Applied Mi Micro, Samsung does it. So a number of vendors decide to not purchase the, um, the core from ARM, but implement their own because they think they can push things in, in more interesting directions in terms of power or performance or um, other reasons. So here is an example. Um, Apple doesn't purchase the, uh, uh, the ARM implementation uh, of a, an ARM v7A core, but instead implements its own, which it's using is in its own system on chip, which is used in its own uh, phone. Um, so moving progressively towards the, the software support, um, one um, aspect of ARM is that there's very little standardization. Um, the instruction set itself is standardized by the ARM specification. So from the user space code point of view, um, ARM v7 platforms are mostly compatible. There are a few tricks with like neon op uh, instructions being optional. So this means that you can uh, generally take a Linux distribution built for ARM v7 and run it on any ARM v7 based um, SOC. Um, but for the other hardware components around, there's essentially no standardization at all. So from one SOC to the other, the serial port controller may be different. So it's not because you have serial port working on your board A that is gonna work on your board B, unless of course they use the same SOC. But if, if it's a different SOC, you may need a different driver because it's a different um, serial port controller. Um, also, in most ARM SOCs, the hardware inside the chip is memory mapped, so it's by doing memory read, memory write, that you talk to the, uh, the different peripherals. And there's no dynamic uh, enumeration or discovery mechanism. So you cannot ask the hardware what, who you are, what are you capable of, and, um, and that you have to know that in advance. Fortunately, there's lots of hardware reuse. So the cores are, the CPU cores are reused across SOC vendors. But even for the other hardware blocks around, SOC vendors very often purchase IP blocks from other vendors. Companies like ARM, Cadence, Synopsys, Mentor Graphics, Imagination Technologies um, make their business out of, amongst other things, selling IP blocks. So you can go to ARM 
and say, hey, um, I see you have this Mali GPU. I'm interested in bringing a GPU on my system. Can I purchase a license to bring this GPU into my SOC? You can go to Cadence and say, hey, I see you have this internet controller that's available. Can I uh, purchase a license and bring it into my system? And when uh, SOC vendors do that, then we've, we end up with the same IP block in completely different SOCs, potentially from different vendors. And since they are the same IP blocks, their programming model, their set of registers, their behavior is the same, and we can reuse the same driver uh, in, in terms of uh, Linux kernel or bootloader support. Um, vendors also reuse massively IP blocks across generations of their processors. So they uh, um, uh, change their um, SOC line every year or every two years or every three years, depending on, on, on the vendors and their target market. But when they do so, they very often reuse IP blocks for things that are not very innovative. As an example, Marvel is uh, using an SPI controller IP block, um, which is, has been the same for the last 10 or 15 years. So we've written a Linux driver for that 15 years ago, and it's still working fine for the latest ARM V8 uh, SOC that, they've, that they, uh, they've released, just because it doesn't make a lot of sense to invest more time in something as, uh, I would say, as trivial as an SPI uh, controller. So this allows from a software support to massively uh, reuse drivers. But sometimes it's not easy to figure out out of the, the data sheets of the um, SOCs that actually it's the same IP block. So we've, I've seen several cases where someone writes a brand new driver for what appears to be a new IP block, and then the maintainer of that subsystem in the kernel, once the driver gets submitted, says, this is weird, it looks really, really like this other driver. And then you realize, yeah, indeed, to the exception of like two register offset and two bit masks or things like that, it's actually exactly the same IP block. So it's been reused in one way or another. So we've, for example, discovered um, that the i 2 c controller used in Marvel SOCs is exactly the same as the one used in all winner SOCs, uh, to the um, exception of the layout of the register, which are completely mixed for some reason. But it's the same driver is used in Linux. Um, BIOS, so if you're using x86, you're used to um, having something like a BIOS as a firmware. Um, we don't have anything like that on, on ARM, um, at least as of today, um, at least not in a standardized form. Each ARM SOC contains a little bit of ROM that um, is like, directly part of the, the chip itself, and it implements the, the boot strategy. So each family of ARM processor has a different way of booting. In general, it kind of has a behavior that is more or less the same between uh, different ARM processors. It kind of scans for different storage devices, trying to find a bootloader somewhere, load it somewhere into memory, but the details are very, very specific to each processor. So if you look at how an RMX6 from Freescale boots and how, I don't know, an all winner processor boots, it's completely different. Usually what they do is that they try to find a bootloader with some like signature or marker and some storage location and load it into an internal uh, memory in the processor because at this stage, the external memory is not yet initialized, not yet available. So we have a, a, usually a two-stage booting process with a small first stage that just initializes the memory and loads the second stage. Uh, often these ROM code also provide a recovery method. So if there's no um, code at all on the platform, it's kind of a brick. Um, and this ROM code offers a way of recovering from that situation. Um, in terms of bootloaders, we don't really use that often grub grub2 on ARM platforms. U-boot is kind of the de facto standard, so it's a completely uh, different bootloader project. It's also GPL licensed, but it's a, a different project. It has support for many architectures, not only ARM, but poor PC, MIPS, and many other um, uh, more funky architectures. Bearbox is also um, quite popular, though uh, a lot less than, than U-Boot by far. They have also a lot of uh, companies making their own bootloaders, especially in areas where security and or DRM-related um, um, aspects are, are involved. So your uh, average um, set-top box or phone or things like that uh, typically use kind of a more homegrown um, bootloader. Their grub is gaining some traction, especially with ARM64 entering the server space. A lot of people are trying to bring the same technologies as the one used on, on Intel uh, to the ARM architecture, um, such as the same bootloaders or even at the uh, BIOS level with uh, UEFI and things like that. 
Raspberry Pi, if you're using that, is kind of a very weird special case with the firmware running on the GPU. It's by far not a, a, the, common, the common way of, of booting ARM SOCs. Um, so we've got a first stage bootloader, as I've said. In some cases, it's a separate project. For example, on Atmel SOCs, they provide a separate project that provides just the first stage, and then in the second stage, you can use U-Boot or Bearbox or whatever second stage you prefer. And for some other platforms, let's say um, um, Freescale or TI platforms, it's U-Boot um, or Bearbox itself that um, compiles itself twice, once in the first um, uh, stage that is very small, uh, to fit the, the, the constraints of the platform and the second stage that is much bigger and provide uh, more functionality. Typically, those bootloaders, we interact with them over the serial port, so we don't necessarily have a screen or a keyboard or things like that. Uh, regularly have to help people um, uh, starting up with, with embedded and then after talking to them for um, um, 20 minutes or half an hour, I realize, but do you have, do you have a serial port access? I don't know, I'm just using a keyboard and a screen. Mm, okay. Um, so you really need a serial port to interface with anything low level in, in, in embedded uh, system uh, based on ARM. So the boot process looks really like this. Um, the ROM code, so that's part of the SOC itself. There's nothing you can change in there. It's fixed in stone. Um, it's stored in the SOC in ROM. When you power up the SOC, it runs. It locates the first stage bootloader, typically in NAND flash or SPI flash or USB, SD, anything like that. And loads it into an internal memory, internal SRAM, and runs it. And that's the point where you get control at the software level. So this, from this stage, you can change things. In most cases, we use that first stage to load the second stage, which provides more functionality. You have a, a prompt, and which provides commands. You can load kernel images. You can load other things, uh, run tests, run like diagnostics, and, and stuff like that. And that second stage is typically used to load a Linux kernel image and run it. Um, so moving on to the kernel support, um, I need to get back on, on to this hardware um, discoverability thing. On x86, most of the hardware can be discovered at runtime. Most of the hardware is on PCI or USB, which are buses that provide dynamic enumeration. You can ask a PCI bus, who is on the bus? Who are you? Hey, I'm an NVIDIA graphics card. I can do this and that. Hey, I'm an Intel um, Ethernet controller. I can do this and that. Um, for the rest, ACPI provides additional uh, hardware description. So thanks to this, the kernel doesn't need to know in advance what hardware it's going gonna, it's gonna to find when it boots. It will, during its boot process, query the hardware, and the hardware will tell the system what's there. On ARM, there is no such mechanism that exists at the hardware level, and so we have to find another way. So in the old days, um, the way it was done is that the kernel code itself would hard code the description of what's on your hardware platform. So the, the bootloader passed to the kernel a number that uniquely identifies the hardware platform you're booting on, and the kernel looks at this number and says, oh, okay, you're booting on platform 1234. So platform 1234, I know it's a Freescale IMX6-based development board which has this and this and this and this and this peripherals. And this was all hard coded in C code. In, uh, 2010, 2011, I'm not sure exactly when that the effort started, but that's about that, that time frame. The uh, kernel developers of the ARM community decided to switch to a different solution to represent the hardware called the device tree. And I'm going to spend a few slides on that. And this effort was done together with another effort called multi-platform, uh, about which I'm, I'm going to see a few words uh, as well. So the device stream is a tree of nodes that describe non-discoverable hardware. Things that you can discover, like PCI, USB devices, don't, you don't need to represent that in the device tree. Only things that cannot be discovered. And it provides information such as where are the registers to program the hardware, uh, what are the interrupt lines, the DMA channels, what type of hardware that is, and lots of other non-discoverable information. And it's provided by the firmware to the operating system. So it's not a Linux-specific technology at all and actually originates from the PowerPC world where it has been used for many, many, many years, uh, way, more, way more than, than uh, uh, when it was used on, on ARM. And so the idea is that your firmware can be a BIOS, can be the bootloader, can be anything below the operating system, contains the hardware description and provides it to the operating system, which can then read it at boot time and um, uh, this way know what's in the system. It's um, source format. Um, called DTS, which gets compiled into a binary format called DTB to be more efficient in reading uh, from the uh, 
operating system point of view. So I'm not going to get into the details of device trees just to show you what it looks like more or less. So it's a tree um, of nodes that contains properties that describe hardware. And this node describes uh, one UART controller, gives the addresses of registers, gives the, um, the, the, the corresponding driver in the operating system. This gives another register and the corresponding driver. So we've got here two hardware blocks which, are, uh, which use the same compatible string, so they use the same driver in the kernel. And, but different uh, register addresses. So it's an SOC where we have um, two instances of a UART controller. So we have two UART controllers that behave the same. So they have the same programming models, the same registers. They, we can use the same driver. Only the uh, interrupt is going to be different and the registers are going to be different. So we have two instances of the same, um, the same device. And here we can see a, a case of a reuse of IP blocks. So that's Sun5e is a all winner based um, SOC and they use for their UR controller a Synopsys IP block. So they actually they purchase from Synopsys the right to use their IP block um, to implement an, a UR controller. So we have a single uh, Linux driver that is used across many uh, SOCs. This file here describes the, the SOC itself, so the processor and it gets included into another file that describes a board. So that's one specific board that uses that SOC and which specifies the additional hardware information. So it says what is the name of the board, that we have an LED connected on this uh, specific pin, that we have the first UART controller that is enabled with some additional properties. So we describe all the hardware, what are the different components, how they are connected with each other. This gets compiled into a binary form and we pass that to the kernel with, that can read this information and um, uh, ask the different drivers to basically manage uh, these devices. So it's now used for almost all ARM platforms. There are a few ones that haven't been converted, but the vast majority of the popular ones have been converted. ARM64 mandates the use of uh, the device tree. Um, so it's, all of them are device tree um, compliant, I would say. Um, it's used by the, the kernel itself, of course, but it's also in some platforms used by the bootloader so that the bootloader doesn't need to repeat the hardware description. It's in terms of source code, it's currently stored in the Linux kernel tree. So it's supposed to be a Linux independent technology, but it is currently in fact very tied to the Linux kernel. They are even stored inside the Linux kernel source tree. There was at some point a plan for a separate repository, um, but that, that has never occurred so far. It's supposed to be OS agnostic, so FreeBSD and other uh, operating systems can potentially um, um, use a device tree, so it doesn't contain Linux specific information. In practice, it is not that easy to make it completely um, OS agnostic and backward compatible, but people are really trying um, hard in this uh, direction. And the idea is that when you uh, start up your system, your bootloader loads the kernel image into memory, and next to that, it loads the device tree image, and it passes the address of the device tree to the kernel when it boots. And this way, the kernel can read the device tree, find out what is the description of the platform, and trigger what, what's necessary in the different device drivers. At the kernel level, we have support for the ARM core. This is generally done by the ARM engineers themselves. Uh, support for things like the MMU, the caches, the virtualization stuff. It's in Arch ARM and Arch ARM64. And it's generally available in Linux upstream even before any ARM SOC is available with this ARM core. So they use lots of emulation to uh, test their uh, Linux support before we have even an actual chip on your, on your desk. So that's directly done by ARM. There's usually not much to worry about. Support for the ARM SOC and the hardware platform is a very different story. It requires drivers for each and every hardware block that you've seen on the block diagram, and you multiply that by the number of SOCs. That's a massive amount of drivers that are needed to support all of those SOCs. So it requires drivers. It requires also device tree descriptions for the different SOCs and different boards. So that's a lot, lot of work. So sometimes it's available upstream. Sometimes it's available only in vendor forks, and if you've been to um, uh, Jonathan Corbett's talk uh, earlier today, he uh, mentioned that, that aspect as well. Uh, so not everything is supported in the, in the upstream kernel. So typically, what do you have to support uh, ARM system on chip? You've got a bunch of what I call 
core drivers. So drivers for peripherals that are not really like visible to the outside, but are really important to make other uh, I, uh, hardware blocks operate properly. Things like clock drivers, reset controller drivers, pin boxing uh, controllers, interrupt controllers, timer controllers, GPIO controllers. These are really the base of the um, um, SOC support. Thank you. There are peripheral drivers then to support everything that allows to communicate with the outside world, uh, buses, display controllers, Ethernet controllers, and so on. And sometimes there's a little bit of platform code uh, in Arch Arm, Mac, and the name of the uh, uh, SOC family for things like power management, SMP support, but this is uh, gradually uh, being phased away in favor of more uh, device drivers. And that was part of the multi-platform effort to move a lot of platform-specific code um, ad hoc code into uh, proper driver subsystems. On ARM64, there's no platform code at all. Um, power management and SMP activities are handled by making calls to the firmware using a, an ARM-specific, um, um, say, uh, protocol called the PSCI. Um, so most vendors, what they do to add support for their process, ARM processor, they fork the Linux kernel, they add all the drivers that they need, and as Jonathan said earlier today, that can be millions of lines of code, and then they ship that to people. Um, so if you get that, then it means you're essentially locked into using that specific kernel version. You cannot upgrade, you cannot uh, change the kernel version because there's so much uh, difference between where you are and upstream, there, there's no lock you can um, move to a newer version. Generally, this support from vendor is not of excellent quality, it, it depends. There are, there are better uh, ones than others, but in many cases, it's not that great, at least it's not in par with uh, upstream expect expectations in terms of code quality. And situation got, I would say, somewhat worse with Android, uh, because what happens with Android is essentially, you've got the mainline Linux kernel, Google takes a version of it, adds the Android stuff on top of it, then this gets taken by SOC vendor that adds support for their SOC in there, and then this gets taken by handset or tablet vendors that add the support for their platform. And that's what you get at the end. So you're like four ops or three ops actually uh, away from, from mainline and that's usually millions of lines of code. Fortunately, more and more vendors engage with uh, the upstream Linux uh, community and submit patches. Uh, then they start understanding that it's actually better for them, will cost them uh, less money down the road um, rather than uh, having to upgrade all their, uh, their stuff uh, once in a while to provide uh, newer kernel versions. And the community is also making a lot of uh, effort in this direction. So in, in cases where vendors are not very cooperative, um, uh, hobbyists or other developers or companies who are interested in some of these um, uh, SOCs um, work on supporting them in the upstream, in the upstream kernel. So for example, old winner is uh, the support in mainline is fully community contributed. There's no involvement from, from the vendor, even though it, there's actually pretty good support in mainline uh, nowadays. Going multi-platform, um, yep, I'll be there, only two more slides. Um, so originally when you were building an ARM Im kernel image, it could only boot on one given platform or a few platforms that use the same processor. There was no way you could build a single kernel image that could boot on a Freescale based platform and on a, I don't know, Texas Instruments based platform. You had to build two separate kernel images. So if you want to make a Linux distribution that, that installs on all uh, ARM platforms, it was a nightmare. You had to build like tens of different kernel images, not manageable. So there was a wish to have a behavior that is more similar to what you, you have on x86, where you build a single a binary kernel, which might be a little bit big because it does like a, a fairly significant number of features and drivers, but at least this single kernel image boots on every platform. So uh, together with the, the, the switch to the device stream, um, a lot of work has been um, undergone to uh, move to multi-platform, where the idea is that um, a single kernel image can support a wide range of ARM platforms. So essentially it's moving from uh, the, the mindset of everything is decided at compile time to the mindset of everything is decided at runtime. So um, this led to the creation of numerous driver subsystems, uh, cleaning up lots of code, moving things around. There's been lo a lot of work, but now that work is done and almost all of the ARM platforms are multi-platform compatible 
And this means you can build a single kernel that puts on all ARM platforms. So it's actually a little bit more subtle than that. You can build a single kernel that puts on ARM v4 and v5 platforms on one side, one that builds for ARM v6 and v7 platforms on another side, and finally another one that builds uh, that uh, boots on all ARM v8 platform on the on, on the final side. So it's still not all of the ARM platforms because there are uh, too many differences in the instruction set and MMU and stuff like that to make something that works across the board. Um, but it's much, much better than, than it was. So for example, you can do uh, uh, make arch R multi v7 dev config. That's the default kernel configuration that builds a kernel that supports all ARM v7 platforms that the kernel uh, supports. And it actually works. To conclude, uh, let's talk a little bit about the um, um, root file system um, aspect. You can use a regular desktop distribution. That's what lots of people do, Debian, Ubuntu, Raspbian, Fedora. You can use that on ARM to support um, the ARM architecture. Um, of course, there are lots of specialized systems for embedded, Android being famous, Tizen, and many other uh, systems. But I wanted to mention that um, in, in the uh, more deeply embedded uh, world, lots of, of companies um, use embedded Linux build system to produce more customized system uh, than what uh, general purpose Linux distribution provides. So tools like the Octo project, open embedded, build root, open WRT, that can, this kind of tools provides a more um, stripped down and, and uh, customized uh, systems that you can use on ARM or other uh, platforms. And I'm way over time, so um, I think I have maybe time for one or two questions, not even. So if there are any questions, I'll be around in the hallway after my talk. Thanks a lot for Please attending.